So I am happy to be here to introduce uh, Katie, but just so you know who I am, I'm Shelly Patton from the Michigan Department of Ed, and welcome everyone to the Go Michigan. Woohoo! Yeah. I actually go green for me. But. Um, Katie McKnight believes that all children can succeed and have worked professional. Oh, see, I had to change this because somebody left, so I'm going to sound funny. So she believes that all children can can can. Uh, can succeed. Succeed. Yay! And All she right. has worked with many schools in the United States and internationally. Dr. McKnight is a literacy advocate and scholar. She is a distinguished professor of research at National Louis University and is a sought-out presenter and professional development provider. Educators in schools where she has partnered describe her as helpful, knowledgeable, and a teacher's teacher. She has her 17th book coming out in two weeks. And she will be doing a book signing about 15 minutes after the session near the registration desk. So if you're interested, you can go see her and get one of her books signed. Please welcome Katie. Yay! Yeah. If you're looking for Catherine, that's me too. Um, but I go by Katie McKnight. And, and my website, if you'll notice, just to make it really confusing, oh, I don't have it actually up there, is KatherineMcKnight.com. Don't go to KatieMcKnight.com because she's a porn star, just so you know. Yeah, yeah. And I always tell everybody that that's my other job. Okay, moving right along. You know it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, start with that. I am so impressed that there's actually this many people in the room at 9 a.m. on Sunday. Um, uh, so, so give yourself a, a, a pat on the back for getting here. And I see there's lots of coffee going on. So those of you who are hanging out in the back, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to come up front because if it were me, I'd be back there too, you know, and, and drinking my coffee. And if the talk got boring, I'd check out the new specials on Zulily. So, so you're good. You're good. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. And the hardest, the greatest challenge of this kind of presentation in an hour is I have so much that I want to share. And I have to get it down into the OxyClean infomercial. And that's always very, very challenging. So um, I have my contact information. Uh, please contact me if you have further questions or want more information. I'm always glad. Um, I, I, I relish the opportunity to talk to fellow educators um, about what's going on in their particular context. And, and it sounds pithy, but I really do believe to my core that all children can succeed. I believe it. And, and I live it, and it is my vocation. Um, it is why I, I travel all over the world, um, especially in the United States. A lot of my colleagues look at me and say, well, why are you going to that school? Um, and, and it's that school that gives me um, fuel and inspiration in the work that I do. And I see it happen over and over and over again and this is where the growth mindset comes in, is that a school will be stigmatized for even decades, and all of a sudden we go in, and it's not what a publisher um, may have advocated as a program. It's about us. It's about education. It's about teachers. It's about the principal leader in the building, and it's about us as teachers. We are not the problem. We are the solution. And if it were that easy to have an intervention program that kids could plug into, we wouldn't be sitting here at 9 o'clock in the morning trying to get some ideas, right? So it's about us and how do we inspire our colleagues to make the change. So I will be the first person in the room this morning to admit that I don't have all the answers. But I have lots of ideas and I want to share them with you in the next hour. So of course, I'm sure you're familiar with this wrong button, um, is that this is what National Assessment for Educational Progress indicates. This is why you're in the room, right? 60% of our kids in grades 4, 8, and 12 are not proficient readers. This is a problem. And then what has happened, you know, I was in higher ed for 15 years, and then once my kids got old enough, I started working even more in schools and kind of ran away from the university. And, and, and that's really where my heart is. That's where my passion is, is working in schools. And, and what happened in higher ed, I'll tell you from a professor's standpoint, is that we had more students applying to college than ever before. But more students than ever before were not prepared for college. So what happens then is the two-year and four-year colleges are offering all these developmental reading, writing, and math courses. 
and, and, and it's great. They won't tell you this, but it's a cash cow because they basically are getting an extra semester of tuition before students can even start their degree work. And, and of course, these are our most vulnerable students, right? So if they don't have success and they don't have that growth mindset in that first semester and encouragement, they drop out. So that's a problem, right? So let's get at it. I want to share some things with you. Dick Allington, one of our most important literacy researchers out there, really important guy. I'm from Chicago, so it's guy, OK? And uh, he, yeah, it's like, here he is, like this you know, great research professor. OK, here's what this guy says, all right? He says he did a meta-analysis, and it was published in Ed Leadership about, about four years ago. And he looked at schools that had the greatest growth, OK? Not achievement, not how many kids passed the test. Test is a four-letter word, as far as I'm concerned, and not the good kind. Yeah, in, in education, test, quiz, data sometimes can be, you know, if it's, if it's used for evil, not good. And, and so he found six things, um, six aspects that led towards growth and achievement in his meta-analysis. And the first thing was that every school had a really clearly articulated literacy plan that was actually followed. And my wheelhouse is more in middle school, high school. Um, uh, unless they're hormonal and pimply, I'm a little challenged to understand them, OK? So I love the kids with hormones, that they ooze hormones. Um, those are my people. And, and what he found was that there were six things that led towards achievement. And it's interesting, because when I go into middle schools, especially high schools that are underachieving, I'll say, hey, what's your literacy plan? And everyone looks at me like this, eh? Yeah, and, and it's not a blame thing. It's just most middle school and high school teachers don't have a background in literacy. We have content expertise, but, but not necessarily the, the, the reading expertise that the teachers of the little people do. And, and it's not a blame thing. It just is, right? So, so how do we close that? All right, so this is what he found. The first thing is that every child reads accurately, OK? With the little people, that means that kids have the decoding knowledge. They understand that CH means ch, B means but. With the older kids, generally, we don't have a decoding problem. Sometimes we do, but that's a whole other animal when kids come in in sixth grade and they still have issues with decoding. For us, it tends to be in sixth grade through 12, comprehension and vocabulary. Okay, that's a whole other presentation. Okay, so, so getting back to this, in, in the older kids, let's say a sixth grader is reading about geography, and they come across the word continent, and they read it as content or content. They have the initial, middle, and end sound right, but they don't have enough decoding proficiency to sound out those tier three level vocabulary words that we encounter more often in sixth through 12th grade content as we get more complex with text. Okay, then the next one is that every child reads something he or she understands, all right? So if we're textbook dependent and I'm teaching fifth grade, okay, so tell me if this is true. In most classes in your, in your buildings or in your district, and I have a fifth grade class, and let's say I have 28 kids there. I have about maybe three or four kids who are a little bit above level, a chunk of kids who are on level, another chunk who are a little bit below level, and then another chunk that are really below level. A lot of the Title I schools that I work in, it's usually two or three are on level, big chunk a little bit under, another one below that, and then kids who are really, really struggling. That's what I usually encounter more often. So we can't depend on textbooks because we're not differentiating our reading. And, and it's like the Goldilocks philosophy. The porridge has to be just right. So when I work in schools, I really empower colleagues to look at the materials that they're teaching and start giving kids choice. Because the cool thing, the sexy thing about it, because as soon as you say sexy when you're presenting, everybody perks up. But the sexy thing about it is that, is that kids tend to choose what they can handle. They don't pick things that are too hard for them. Now, you will have Poindexter who picks Pat the Bunny, right? And that's a separate conversation because they should be reading Foucault's Pendulum, right? So, so that's a different kind of situation. 
Okay, and then every child reads about something um, that's personally meaningful. That doesn't mean that every kid, even in 11th and 12th grade, writes about their first puppy. What that means is, let's say, again, that I'm a social studies teacher. I teach US history. And uh, we're studying the Bill of Rights. And I tell the students, I want you to pick one of the Bill of Rights that you think is no longer relevant in, in, in 2018. So I've already put them in, in a um, uh, context where they're doing evidence-based argumentation. I always omit the Second Amendment because it gets a little squirrely. But the things that, that, that usually kids pick is about quartering of soldiers. You know, and, and, and so we pick that. So that's what I'm talking about as far as picking within. I'm still working on the skill, which is evidence-based argumentation. The content is the Bill of Rights, but I've given them choice within. And that's a big brain shift for us, right? Because no longer do we have to teach content. Well, we do teach content. I don't want anybody to say, ow, oh, Katie McKnight says we don't teach content anymore, because that's not the case. Content is the vehicle to develop skills. Because those of us who are in the electric typewriter crowd in college, who use an electric typewriter or manual? Yeah, the man, whoa, the manual, yeah, own it, baby, own it. And onion skin paper, yeah, cool. So, so um, uh, our challenge was always getting our hands on information. That's not the challenge now. There's so much information, kids have to make sense of it, right? Okay, so then the next one is that we talk about our reading and writing. Kids need to talk about what they're doing, what they're learning. The neuroscience is crystal clear. Um, I'm very lucky. Next week, I'm going to be in um, San Francisco, and one of like my second favorite city next to Chicago. Thank you. And um, I, I, at the Learning and Brain Conference, and I love that conference when I present there because I get to hang out with the neuro nerds, and I learn so much from them. Um, but what we have found is that kids, when they're talking about their reading and writing, they get greater understanding, they're rehearsing the information. It tends to shift more into their long-term memory. Okay, And it's not just reading and writing, it's also math too. Every child listens to a fluent adult read out loud. Okay, Now, even in the upper grades, audio assist, I almost said cassette. I was like, get my eight track. Yeah, right. Thank you. You can come with me next, next stop. San Francisco, we'll have fun. Yeah, yeah, I got a plant now. And then after that is Florida. Yeah, you in? Okay, good. All right. I need some plants in the audience. All right, so, so um, audio assist, when kids listen to a fluent adult read out loud, they can um, uh, access more complex text. So, so this is a good thing. And then with the little guys, too, they need to listen to a fluent adult read. This is why round-robin reading is a tool of the devil, okay? Not that I have a strong opinion about it, but it is, it is, it is Satan's maiden to use round-robin reading, okay? Round-robin reading is, is, is a scourge on education. Um, you may not know this, but the Zika virus is spread by round-robin reading, okay? Um, the current flu epidemic is round-robin reading, okay? Um, so if you want to take that responsibility to cause, you know, a, 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 you know a, a horrible outbreak in your school or in your community, go ahead, do that round robin reading. And popcorn reading is round robin reading in sheep's clothing. Okay, it's the same thing. All right. Now it's different than let's say the three of us who are in a small group and we're reading together. That's different. But when we have round robin reading. What happens is we keep hearing disfluent reading. Even if Hermione Granger wants to read all the time, no, 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 no. If she were the expert, she'd be teaching the class, even though she'd love to. But, but, but we're the ones you know, that should be doing that. And also that audio assist is amazing, amazing stuff. OK, and then the last one is that every child chooses um, what they read. And again, it's a democratic dictatorship. We want to give them the impression that they have choice when they really don't. So, so as an English teacher, I might do a unit on Edgar Allan Poe. And instead of everybody reading The Black Cat, I might have four stories that the kids read. Because remember, it's the skills that's driving the instruction, not the content. So we don't need to know what Jay Gatsby's neighbor's dog's name is, OK? 
Alan Satomer, who's a really well, uh, he's an established uh, young adult uh, author and, and a personal friend of mine. And um, he was California Teacher of the Year like about nine or ten years ago. And uh, he said that on, on one of the, the programs, I won't mention which one, where one of his books was on there and then you know the kids take a quiz and then they get credit for, for reading it. And uh, he said that he tried to take the quiz and he couldn't pass it. This is a guy who wrote the book and he can't pass his own quiz, you know. So, so when kids talk about books, um, uh, that's really where, where the, um, uh, what am I trying to say, where the um, energy is, where, where everything springs from, which is not what I wanted to say, but I faked it. Okay, so, um, so how do you move a struggling school? So based on what we know, what Allington says, what leads to growth, what do we know then about, about moving a struggling school to a higher performing school? And I want to share some case studies, some schools that I've worked in where we didn't focus so much on a particular program um, that was bought and implemented. If it were that easy, we wouldn't be in this room right now. If all kids could plug into a computer and go through a program and that solved the problem, we wouldn't be sitting in this room, okay? So as I said earlier, we are the ones who are going to make that change, all right? So, so this is what I found out. And a lot of it, you know, I've learned along the way, every context is different. But the bottom line is it's about professional development. It is about working as a community of educators. That's it. And in some places I was successful, some places not so much. And I'm going to talk about that, okay? All right, so here's the plan. The plan is this, and it's based on what we know about balanced literacy. It's based on what we know about the neuroscience and how kids learn. And, and basically, if you're familiar with things like daily five, guided reading, literature circles, you're going to see a lot of, 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 of um, convergence in this model that I created. So I'm giving full credit to all of the other uh, professionals that I know that I have stolen from. Okay, and basically I put all of those things in a blender and this is what came out. My focus is really on content too, of making sure that it's not how to read, but once we've cracked the code, how do we use our reading skills to gain more understanding and be able to articulate what we know and understand about the content and the disciplines that we're studying. That's what I'm getting at, okay? So the first is, is that mini lesson. We have to chunk instruction. In most of the underperforming schools that I go to, I see kids in rows. I see the teacher lecturing and the kids in rows. And usually what happens when I talk to colleagues, they're terrified, not terrified, they are un comfortable with putting kids in small groups because they think everything's going to go nuts. Well, I'm here to tell you that when, when we start shifting to this model and kids are working in collaborative groups, t the first thing that uh, colleagues will say to me when I go visit their classrooms, I'll say, hey, what do you notice that's different about your kids? I can't believe how focused and attentive they are now. And it's because we've gotten our, our instruction into digestible chunks. What we know about the brain is that our, our, our attention span is finite. Our ability to stay on task is finite. And, and kind of the formula, roughly, is your chronological age times one. So if I'm teaching, God love kindergartners, okay? Because they're just like squirrel, 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 okay? So, so if I'm teaching, for instance, sixth grade, how old are they in sixth grade? 11, 11, 12. That is the threshold. That's the maximum for their memory, all right? And, and so when I see large group instruction and it's going beyond 11 minutes, it literally sounds like this to the kids. Or like that. They, they don't get it. So think of a bucket, because I started my career as an English teacher, so everything's a metaphor. So think of a bucket, and I'm filling it with water. I got the hose going. After 11 minutes, that bucket's going to be full. If I keep running the hose, what's going to happen? It's going to spill out. So when kids say to you, oh, I don't remember that, they really don't, OK? So I'm here to tell you, too, at 51, my attention span should be 51 minutes. Anybody who's met me and knows me for more than 10 minutes knows that that's not true. 
Yeah, you can laugh. Okay. I, I won't be offended. It won't be bullying if you laugh at me. Okay. All right. I love it when somebody says, oh, we're starting a bullying program. And the first thought in my mind is, oh, good. We need to get better at that. You know, it's like, oh, you mean bullying prevention or bullying awareness. No, we're going to start a bullying program. Okay. Anyway, so the first thing is the mini lesson whole group instruction. So I introduce a skill. I introduce content in that 10 to 15 minutes, and it depends on the age. So if I have seniors, I might go seven to 18 minutes, I could. If I have first graders, it's six minutes, all right? So again, God love the primary teachers. And then it's guided practice, and a lot of folks forget this part, but the guided practice is really critical because what we know, John Medina totally recommend his book, Brain Rules. It's one of those books that has revolutionized my thinking as an educator. Highly, highly recommend it. You're, you're on time, don't worry about it. The prizes are underneath your seat. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go, and, it, and it's more than a magnet. Okay, so anyway, getting back on task, is that um, the guided, yeah, see there's a perfect example. See, my attention span is not 51 minutes. It just isn't, okay? So, so the guided practice is I take what I did in that mini lesson. So let's say that in uh, science class, um, we're looking at fungus among us and how fungus um, uh, uh, works in an ecosystem. And then I give kids a case study about toe fungus. And they talk about how toe fungus works in an ecosystem. Is anybody getting really grossed out now? It's a great seventh grade lesson, is to talk about toe fungus and jock itch. They're all over it, no pun intended. Oh my gosh, they love it, yeah. Um, fungus is like one of the, I, I think in a past life I was a science teacher because I love weird science. The weirder it gets, the better. Um, and then the next part are centers. And centers are clearly articulated um, uh, opportunities to practice with content or skill. And here's the thing, is that when I teach this in different schools and districts, I don't talk about formative assessment RTI, or if you're a multi-tiered intervention state, you notice how we always change things in education. And then um, differentiated instruction and building content knowledge. Yeah, I've got all that. Look at that. It's like all of that is there. If we focus on the pedagogy, on the teaching, all of those other things are taken care of. Because I feel, as an educator, we keep getting things thrown at us. Like, oh, go to this PD on DI on Friday and start implementing it on Monday. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's like the, the circus act where you've got all the sticks and then the plates are spinning and you're trying to get all of them spinning at the same time. That's the perfect metaphor for a classroom teacher. And also, you know, um, uh, uh, principals and, and, oh my gosh, principals. Like, how many of you are principals? How many of you have already fielded like five phone calls today or five emails, yeah, for the crisis du jour in your building? You know, I got a hint for you. Turn off the phone. It's Sunday. <laughs> Sunday is fun day. Yeah, you're like, no, I can't. The whole place will blow up. I, I know, I know, I get it. So anyway, so this is what it looks like. This is what I introduced. There's four foundational centers. The first is the teacher-led center, which is magic because that's my opportunity to RTI, to differentiate. I can also use formative assessment, descriptive feedback for my students. And then the next one is reading together more practice. So, so kids are reading together. For instance, let's take that fungus example. Maybe they're reading more about zombie fungus or they're reading about legal mushroom growing. And um, uh, good, I'm glad to see you are totally coming on the road with me. And then um, I, 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 they're reading about different kinds of fungi. Okay, so that could be the reading together center. And then writer's craft is not necessarily that they're writing something from beginning to end. They may just be writing about um, what they're noticing about fungus, some assumptions that they can make, or for instance, in an ELA class, maybe we're working on introductions or citing or something like that. So it's usually a chunk of writing, a specific skill that my kiddos need work on. And then the last one is vocabulary. Math teachers, vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary. Whenever I poll a group like this, I say, what is the one factor that makes text complex? 90% of the room will say vocabulary. And when we're teaching children of poverty, you know all of the research about it, that they're not exposed to enough vocabulary. So math teachers in particular have it rough. Because if a kid comes across a problem and it says, factor, blah, 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 and the kid doesn't know what factor is, 
they're done, right? They can't go past go. But whereas in other text-heavy subjects like ELA, science, uh, um, uh, science and social studies, we can usually figure out a little bit about a word. Um, but, but in math, it gets so isolated, it's very challenging. So, so yeah, math teachers have it tough, OK, on that one, on the vocabulary. So and then in addition to that, I'm not going to go into it, in the different subject areas, then um, we can add centers as well. So for instance, in ELA, we might add a grammar center. We might have something on literary elements. Um, Text-heavy subjects like social studies and English, I always have two reading together centers because it's the only way that they're really going to get through the text. In science, it could be something like observation. Um, in social studies, they might do something on maps and graphs or maybe watch um, a video, um, a newscast or something like that as well. Okay. So here are the implementation phases. So when I go into schools, this is where we start. And every school, every district is different depending on just where they are at that, uh, at that point. I was just visiting a school in Washington State um, before I came here, and they're much farther along than I thought they were. So we're ratcheting it up now. They, they basically went through phase one, phase two um, from September till now, and we're well on to starting to plan for next year now um, based on what they've done. They really transitioned quickly. So the first is, is changing the physical environment, getting kids out of rows. And that's where all the high school teachers the flesh starts melting off their face, you know? And they'll say to me, oh, well, but Katie, we're getting our kids ready for college. And I'll say, guess what? College don't work that way no more. It doesn't. Um, college is very different. There's a lot of online classes. There's a lot of collaboration that's required. We really don't do that anymore. And then, oh, you have microphone issues? It's uh, kind yeah. of rubbing a little bit. It's rubbing. OK. And then um, uh, the other thing, too, is chunking instruction. So we want, you know, we don't want, you know, that, that, that marathon lecture that goes from bell to bell. Instruction has to be chunked so kids get practice time because it's more likely that when they have that, 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 that continual practice and also recursive practice, that they're more likely to internalize that skill and content knowledge, all right? And then the next one is increasing cognitive load. So when I go into schools and we've gotten kids out of rows and we're starting to chunk instruction, what I oftentimes see is lots of worksheets. Lots and lots and lots and lots of low-level worksheets. And so then we have a conversation about that. And we start looking at questioning um, Bloom's taxonomy, or if you use Marzano, or if you use depth of knowledge. I call it all Bloomzano web, because it's all the same thing. Um, but I like to go back to Bloom. I like to be simple. I like to go to the source. So I'm a Bloom gal. And um, uh, then we want to increase cognitive load and really develop that faith among colleagues that kids can actually do this work. And then the third one is assessment and feedback. And that's not to say that we're not already doing that. It just means that that is our focus, um, that we're really zeroing in. We have to get out of the mentality of A, B, C, D, and F and do more skills-based assessment. And I don't want to say standards. It's my issue, OK? So my name is Katie. Then you say, See, you're good. I have a problem. My problem is, is calling it standards-based grading. Um, I prefer to call it skills-based grading, because that's what we're really getting at, is the skills for kids, OK? And then um, the next, uh, so this is what it looks like. Phase one, um, seating, getting the kids out of the rows, as I mentioned. Movement, the kids have got to move. Um, that helps with their learning. And guess what? Our kids with special needs, do really, 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 really well in this kind of format. And then um, the next one is chunking our instruction. And then uh, da -da, written directions. Oh my gosh, I can't say that enough. Um, written directions. I have a class of 28 kids. The first time I verbally give directions, 20 of them heard it. The second time I give directions of the original 20, 19 of them forgot it. Yeah, you know that class? I don't know about you, but I hate hearing my name over and over and over and over and over again in class. Uh, oh, we're back for more microphone fun. And now we're going to go to this. Hello. OK. All right, so um, I, I, 
Yeah, directions. Okay, what was that about attention span? So we got to write them down. <laughs> That's the point. We got to write them down. And, and one of the first things that I always say in every single class is read three, then ask me. You cannot McKnight me unless you have read those directions three times. Because if you haven't read those directions three times and you McKnight me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you. Okay? You know, did I tell you I started my career in teaching in the inner city? All right, in, in Chicago, yeah, taught 10 years in Chicago. And then student choice as much as we possibly can. Saturday night is not for writing curriculum. It's not for principals to get that report in on Mon uh, for Monday. It's not for grading papers, all right? How many of you take papers home or reports or things like that and then you feel guilty on Sunday because you didn't get to it? Fess up, okay. Saturday night is for your lover. Okay, you're going to be a much happy educator if you're hanging out with your lover on Saturday. Okay, so it's not for grading. It's not for writing reports. It's not for looking at data. It is not for checking email. Okay, that's, I, that's one of the few times I got applause for that. Boy, you guys need it, huh? If you were hanging out with your lover, you wouldn't have been here at 9 a.m. And if you don't have a lover, don't worry. There's apps for that. We'll set you up. Okay. There you go. All right, so, so, so you want to give kids student choice, but as we know, that's a big investment of time and energy, right? So you do it as much as you can. I give you permission to tell your colleagues and you not to do it every single time. Poof, okay. Carol Ann Tomlinson might have something else to say, but she's not here. Okay, so phase two. Um, collaboration, higher order thinking activities, really getting into the questioning. And then the next is activities promoting learning goal mastery, skills, okay? Not fill in the blank stuff, not matching stuff. We want kids to be asked higher level questions. questions. And I'm sure you know, as the Title I posse, that kids of poverty don't get asked high-level questions with the same frequency as kids in higher socioeconomic um, uh, status. So just because a kid may not be able to answer that question today doesn't mean that you don't ask the question. So because they will eventually get there, but we have to make that expectation. Then, that's that whole growth mindset thing too, by the way. That's the title of this presentation. Okay, and then the next one is formative assessment, getting into that. Formative assessment is back in fashion again, which is a good thing. And then um, RTI, or if you're in a multi-tiered intervention uh, location. And then descriptive immediate feedback. Feedback is not a letter, it's not a grade. It's feedback. This is what you've done, this is what you need to grow. Children of poverty, are, uh, there's quite a bit of research on it, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, is that A, B, C, D, F has a real detrimental effect with children of poverty. So, so when we do this growth mindset model of, of looking at proficiency scales, or here are the skills, this is where you are, you're beginning your development of mastery on this, and this is what you need to get to mastery, that's where the magic happens. Okay, but don't take, oh, and that teacher-led center, magic, okay. So don't take my word for it. Here's, here's kind of some things that have happened. So one of the schools I want to mention um, is in Farmington, New Mexico. Farmington, New Mexico is in the northwest corner of New Mexico. And I was in the Title I school there. There were four middle schools. And um, uh, Mesa View had the stigma of being the worst school in the district. They were at, yeah, dun, dun, dun. They were an F school. Don't you love it when states give schools letter grades? Yep. They moved from an F school to a B school in two years. Rock on, baby. Rock on. Yeah. And one of the things that we did there is that we had a center-based leadership team. We went to all centers-based instruction, you know, using that model. And then we did a center leadership uh, uh, team. And so what happened is that um, the teachers that were on the center-based leadership team, we had one teacher from every um, subject, and they were invited. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, faculty that were um, 
uh, willing to give and willing to share. And, uh, and, and it was huge. It really helped to transition us. Because you know there's always like four or five teachers in your building that are ready to rock it out. So, so let's see if we can get them on the leadership team. And all, then also folks who have the disposition to do it. Um, Marie was, um, Marie Frost, she uh, was a fifth grade uh, uh, social studies teacher and she was a year away from retirement. So when I came in and started talking about centers, she was like, are you freaking kidding me? You know, she's like, can I just, you know, finish up what I'm doing and that's it? What do you mean I can't have Rose? And she's actually one of my greatest disciples now. And uh, so if you go into my YouTube channel, there's a video of her talking about the transition. I mean, she witnessed it firsthand. And she was instrumental on that leadership team. Um, uh, and then, so, oops, did I skip one there? Yeah, and then, so they did things like peer observation, they did team teaching with their colleagues, um, and then we also had like a panel of experts for like content and implementation. Same thing in East St. Louis. Have you heard about East St. Louis? Yeah, East St. Louis is kind of um, uh, an infamous place. It was made uh, famous by uh, Jonathan Kozel in Savage Inequalities. And it's one of our most impoverished communities in the United States, and it's across the river from St. Louis, hence East St. Louis. And um, uh, really just staggering poverty. And I worked in the two middle schools there. And same thing, we started getting huge transition as soon as we started going into a center's model. This is a district that had been mired with negativity for decades um, and, and lack of growth and achievement. Uh, in the second year of center implementation on NWEA data, we went up in the two middle schools, 15 and 16%, and the high school, I was sure this was wrong, okay, as a researcher too, I started getting my researcher magnifying glass on because I was sure the data was wrong, that there was something wrong, 18% in the high school. Yeah, isn't that crazy? You know, you look at data like that, those of us who have been around are like, okay, something's not right. <laughs> um, they put the wrong, like, uh, scorecard in or something like that. But it was real. It was real because it was sustained, and then they grew from there. So, so here we go. So here's Mesa View. They went from that F school, uh, and it was mostly teacher-directed instruction. Then they moved from a D school. Uh, um, uh, and then to a B school. They're on the trajectory right now to be an A school. That's what their preliminary data is looking, um, looking at. And this is mostly based on park uh, assessments. Um, they had a new principal in 2015, 2016, Jay. And, uh, and this is really important is that the faculty remained relatively stable. And that's a huge thing, especially in a lot of the schools that we're working in, is that the faculty was relatively stable. Same thing in East St. Louis, the faculty was relatively stable. It's really critical. And uh, I, uh, yeah, and then, whoop, go, there we go. So this is kind of, uh, Jay, when uh, I've presented with him in the past, he says, this is the thing that makes me most proud, is look at how teacher performance changed. And it wasn't, uh, there's also some inner rater reliability because Jay isn't the only evaluator. There's also a district evaluator. Uh, there's two district evaluators. So those remain stable, and then Jay came in. But this is what happened, right? So, so they're exemplary and highly effective. Everything shifted towards the top. Here's the coolest thing that happened. Um, Jane, who is the, um, you, you know that the principal secretary runs the whole school, right? Everybody's clear on that? Yeah, so, so you make sure that they're taken care of during the holiday season. Always. And uh, my mom was a, a Chicago public school teacher for 35 years. And the, as soon as I entered the profession, she says, make sure you know who the principal secretary is and who cleans your room at night and you take care of them. And, and it was best advice, yep. And she says, and stay out of the faculty lounge. <laughs> that was the other advice my mom gave me. But anyway, so, so, so um, Jane, the principal secretary, I walk in and it's a day where I'm working with the teacher, so we're pulling them out for um, uh, different shifts. And, and she sees me walk in the door and she's like, yes! And I said, what's up? She says, well, I've got all of my subs. Not only do I have all my subs for today, because you know the peril of, of getting subs, right? And then she says, and the next day, I've got it all locked in. And I said, that's awesome. I said, what's your, what's your magic? What are you bribing them with? She says, here's the deal. Word's gotten out in the community that Mesa View is a really easy sub gig. And I said, what? She says, yeah, because the kids run the classrooms. Yeah, see, oh, you guys are all making yummy noises, too. You're like, mmm. 
Yeah. Isn't that cool? That's the best like uh, anecdotal data I could ever have. Uh, and, and she noticed the difference. The community noticed the difference in that school. Um, and that has always had the reputation of being that school. And then here's something else, too. This is what happened with uh, ELA and mathematics. So overall, they increased in 2015-2016 by 10%. Our biggest shifts were with the Native American population, mostly Navajo, and then also our Latino population, mostly Mexican origin. And then also in math, look at that, what happened too. We also had an increase in math. The following year, math just went in the stratosphere. They had just adopted Agile Minds that year, but then last year's data, 2016, 2017, they were showing double digit growth. And I'm still in touch with them because that's the thing, like when I come in, and I work in a community for a while, I always hold my breath because it's about sustainability, right? So, so I'm still in, in communicado with colleagues in East St. Louis and, um, and Farmington and such, just, you know, how's it going, et cetera, et cetera, because I love making more work for myself too and say, you know, do you need anything or, 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 or such, but really keeping the conversations going. Um, I, and, and so far, they're sustaining it. Here's another thing, too. This is from last year. Um, and you can see that their interim data, um, which is their indicator for the park. So ELA, um, let, this was a year ago, quarter one to quarter two, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, we're showing that kind of growth. Isn't that amazing? And the difference is, is that the kids are doing. That's it. It's about the practice and that the kids are doing, rather than us telling them, right? OK, and then this is what I was talking about, too. See, the, look at that, the double-digit gains, which was different than 2015, 2016. So this was last year. And, and this is what I was referring to with their double-digit gains. It was just going in the stratosphere. And same thing, you know, the teacher-led center gave that opportunity that if kids got stuck or they needed a little uh, additional love, you could bring them to you and say, OK, and, and reteach things. The other thing, too, is that when you have Hermione and Poindexter in class, you can bring them to you, too. and then push them even further, right? Because you're able to do that because you have that teacher-led center. And it seems like a lot to do. And, and my colleagues, like once they take that leap of faith and they start doing it, mostly because it's an administrative directive, right? And, 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 and they hate me for a while. Um, once that happens and they see the shift with their students, they can't believe it. You know, they, they can't believe that their kids are engaged, that they're learning. Um, discipline problems have gone down. They're, they're really kind of stunned by it. Um, and then here's another one, too, George Washington Community School. I worked there about five years ago. Um, and, and here's an example of sustainability. They had a lot of leadership changes. And the gains that we made have not been sustained there. Um, but this is what the work that we did when we were there. They were threatened state takeover. I bet none of you are familiar with that either. Yeah, dun, 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 state takeover. It's like, yeah, if you think you can do a better job, then do it. Hello? Yeah. So our profession, too, let me just say, let me get on my soapbox for a moment. Our profession is the only profession that I can think of where outsiders dictate our practice. I can't think of any other profession that does that. I mean, if you have one, can you tell me after the talk? Because I can't think of anything. Um, but ours is the only profession where we're, 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 we're subject to outsiders. So anyway, so, so this is what happened. Um, this is their ECA passing uh, trend, all right? And you can see Indiana is the dark blue. I have a laser thing. Here it is. And then um, this is the corporation. So that's Indianapolis Public Schools, and that's the school. All right, And you can see when we were implementing the center-based instruction that we were having a much larger increase. Then there was an administrative change here. We went down a little bit, and then we went back up again. And then they had three principals, I think, in a year. And you can see what happens. And, and, and that's the thing. It's, it's about leadership, right? Um, leadership is just so critical for the sustainability. And they also had a um, huge population shift in the faculty, too, that year. And, and most of the teachers that I had worked with are not there anymore. Uh, so it kind of breaks my heart. But that's the biggest thing is that sustainability. And um, so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an honest gal. So uh, here's the success, but here's where, you know, we had success and then it failed. And I think those are important lessons as well. And you notice, too, that I don't say we brought in such and such program from such and such company and implemented it. What it was was about grassroots professional development 
and coaching in the classroom and working together. I've also done a lot of work with Academy for Urban School Leadership, if you're familiar with them. And they're um, a turnaround organization in Chicago. And they have some of the greatest success rates um, of turnaround schools. They don't like close down the school and, 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 and shut it down. They actually go in and they change everything in the school as far as instruction, um, faculty, leadership, everything else. And guess what? Literacy is the cornerstone of that program. And they have two 95, 95, 95 schools in their network uh, and, and really just create substantial growth. And what they do is they invest in faculty and they also have a teaching academy too. And so, so folks who want to become teachers, they go through the teaching academy, they intern at one of the AUSL schools, and then they work as faculty members for five years. And, and that's huge because then you have new teachers, you have that pipeline coming in. Um, so if you want to know more about Academy for Urban School Leadership and just that kind of work, come, come visit me over at the book signing table. And, um, or just email me, okay? Uh, okay, so this is what I talked about with East St. Louis. Um, this is their data, NWEA. So we had documented uh, double-digit growth in the middle schools, 15 to 16%, 18% in the high school. And um, they're meeting more of their learning targets, too, on the park assessment. I just found out last week, anybody who's from Illinois, is that Illinois is getting rid of park. And that's a big political thing, too, because um, uh, only 40% of the kids are passing it. So I bet none of you have ever seen that before, where they change the assessment when nobody's passing it. That's why I don't get invited to state meetings anymore. I don't, you know, because I'll say, well, why are you doing that? And it's all, it's all political. Surprise, surprise. This is their percentage of kids, freshmen students who are on track now. And you can see that it has steadily gone up um, uh, in that district. So they were down to as low as 4%. Then we start going up to 70%, 80% of ninth graders on track. And again, that data, when I look at that 70%, I'm like, eh, something's not right there. What measure are we using? Did we change it? And it's the same measure. Uh, it, it's really kind of um, mind-blowing. Okay, so, so that's what I've got right now. And then, you know, the, uh, the things I, I don't have the hard data right now, but the other things that I want to share with you, too, is um, the school that I'm working with in, in Washington State, uh, again, another Title I school, and kind of, you know, there's a pattern here in my professional life, in case you didn't notice. And uh, uh, same thing, they're, they just got their benchmark data back, and they're seeing uh, double-digit increases. And I go into the classrooms now, I was just visiting there, and I, I just get so excited. I, I'm seeing deliberate um, instruction in vocabulary. Um, I'm also uh, witnessing um, uh, kids are more focused. And the principal said to me, I was there in September, and then I've been emailing back and forth and doing Skype and stuff with some of the teachers. And, and she was saying, yeah, you know what? Here's the only problem that we have. And I said, what's that? She says, the kids are complaining that they're really tired at the end of the day because they don't have any breaks. Yes! <laughs> because, you know, it's the classic thing. The teachers, you know, we, the principals, the teachers, we walk out of school and we're like, you know, this, you know, trying to get to our car. And the kids are like, Bleh! running out the door, and it needs to shift, right? Wear those puppies out. And, and one of uh, my colleagues there, science teacher, Mr. Cooper, it was the line of the, the PD day on Friday. He says, I'm lazy. I want the kids to do all the work. I was like, yeah, that's the quote of the day. And then the other one, too, is uh, um, in Indiana. I'm working at a school in Hammond, Indiana, which is at the bottom of Lake Michigan. Not the bottom of Lake Michigan, south of Lake Michigan. I should say it that way. Yeah. Who's, who's from Hammond? Who's back there? Oh, great. Hammond? Oh, so I'm working at Gavit. Yeah, with Michelle Andes. Yeah, oh my gosh, let's talk later, okay? Oh my gosh, it's great. Anyway, so, so talking to Michelle, they just got their, she's the principal. You know her, yeah. And, and so what we we're finding is that that trend is happening there as well, that we're starting to see um, sustained growth. It's happening in math, and math in, in her school was very much, you know, the um, teacher directed, here's the problem, now you do it. You know, this is kind of my imitation of, of a bad math teacher, right? Okay, so here's the problem, here's how you solve it. Okay, any questions? Okay, I'll show you again. Here it is. Here's the problem again. Here's the solution. And they just do the same thing over and over again. The most dynamic math teachers have kids in centers working and talking about math. The idea of going to the board is, man, that's so old school. That, talking about things that cause, you know, pandemics, you know, that's probably causing the Ebola virus. But anyway... <laughs> 
uh, Ebola outbreaks. So anyway, so what we're finding on preliminary data is that we're seeing that increase at Gavitz as well. Um, so so it's really, you know, and, and the thing is, is that whenever somebody says, oh, you know, this works and you need to do it, it's usually somebody trying to sell me something. And I get very suspicious because I've been in education now for 30 years. And, but it really is about the pedagogy. It's about, about the teaching and learning. It's about those relationships. And it's also about faculty and, and having that growth mindset. When I first started working, going into East St. Louis, the teachers were very blunt with me. I mean, these poor teachers had been Marzano'd. They'd been University of Virginia. They'd been Harvarded. Every single turnaround organization had been in that district telling them that they're broken and that they need to be fixed, which is the most professionally insulting thing that you can say to a group of educators. There's a lot of tuition money that was spent in this room. We're the smartest, the prettiest, and the most handsome. Okay? And the muggles, the non-education world, they don't get it. Okay? So, not that I feel strongly about anything here, mind you. But, so, so what happened in East St. Louis is I go in and they're like, oh, Dr. McKnight, you don't understand. You know, the kids can't, you know, even pass in the hallway and they can't do this and they can't do that. That's why I heard over and over again. And I said, well, then we need to teach them. We need to show them. So Miss Chapman's class, she's a fifth grade social studies teacher, another fifth grade social studies teacher. Um, she's been teaching for 27 years, brilliant woman, and uh, walk in her class, and um, I'm supposed to, to, to co-teach with her that day, and I go in her class, and she says, Katie, I'm ready to kill these kids. They're driving me nuts. Um, they are so loud. And I said, okay, then let's, we have to teach them about voice control. And it really starts with this. And so it's, you know, the kids are like, Bleh! really loud and I say okay five four three two one classic right eyes on me now I'm stopping you because if you look at our norms for centers we need to be at a level one voice so I want you to get control of your voices and get back and notice that the talk is generative it's built on growth not fixed I'm not saying you're too loud I'm saying look at what the norm is let's get control of our voices and meet this expectation they go Five minutes later, blah, 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 blah. five, four, three, two, one, eyes on me. Okay, I'm stopping you again because we're at a level two voice and we should be at a level one. Yeah, exactly. So let's get to a level one voice. Go, get back to work. And then I tell Ms. Chapman, I say, okay, next time they're too loud, you're going to stop them. She's like, okay. She's like, I got this. She's up there. They're getting really, really loud. Five, four, three, two, one. Y'all are too loud. You need to stop talking. That's what she says. And she turns around, looks at me, and she's like, <laughs> you know, she, she knew exactly what she had done. But I do the same thing. You know, I've done things in a certain way for so many years. To change that habit doesn't change overnight. So just like the kids, as we're teaching them habits of, of working and mind, it's the same for us as teachers, right? So as educators. So anyway, so she just turns around. She's like, I know, I know, I know. And it's like, yeah, we don't want to have, you know, um, <laughs> we want them to talk, so telling them that they're too loud and they have to stop talking is totally changing the expectation. Um, and she's like, I know. And she's like, it was, as soon as it was out of my mouth, <laughs> it was not going to work. So then she did it again, like 10 minutes later, and it was perfect. Now, when I went into that class a couple months later, um, we, it was that class that you always had to stop. You know what that class is, right? And, and, you, you, and nobody's ever had that class? That was 1993, third period, 10th grade English for me, my class of the demon spawn. That was it. You know, I know you're never supposed to say that, and I'm really glad that Title I recorded that, speaking of growth mindset. But anyway, um, I, you know, it's like now it's on tape for posterity. And uh, um, uh, tape, gosh, that's old school. He's like, eee. anyway, squirrel. So, so anyway, um, I, 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 her class was one of those classes we always had to stop. But it, it changed from like seven, eight times in a block to more like two. And, and, and the kids started shifting. And the other thing that I noticed, too, at Mesa View and also East St. Louis, when about the second year when I was working in the building, boy, did the mood change with the kids. 
I saw a lot of smiling. Um, uh, kids were saying good morning to me. I can't tell you how, that's like my first litmus test whenever I go into school, is I start talking to kids and I say good morning and they look at me like, who's this lady? Is she like a narc or something? What's the story? And, and, and I start talking to kids and if they don't talk to me and they don't give me eye contact, um, that tells me a lot. Same thing with the faculty, it tells me a lot about what's going on. And, um, but, but you know, in closure, let me just say this, you know, coming back to it, you know, this literacy and learning center model, um, I, I'm really convinced because of what I'm seeing as far as performance, and it has to really, it boils down to great pedagogy. We don't need a program. What we need is to support faculty and our building leaders um, uh, into this kind of mindset and that all kids are capable of high level work. We need to set the stage for them to do that and that expectation. I got lots of other stories in a lot of other schools, a lot of different contexts where it just keeps happening over and over and over and over again. And the most important thing, just as it is for us, we always talk about relationships with kids, it's true of me as well. I don't like being the Friday afternoon PD before spring break. That's brutal, okay? And there's no liquor or chocolate. That's rough, okay? Um, I like to develop relationships in schools and with the teachers um, to really change things. They have to come in and, you know, I have to come in and they have to see me as one who is there to support, not to judge. I know how hard our profession is and how complex it is. So we need to build those relationships just like if I was a kindergarten teacher, I'd need to build relationships as well. That's where the growth happens, um, when we empower the people who are actually, the professionals who are actually working with their kids, with our children. So let me just end with this. My mom, I always end with this. My mom was a Chicago public school teacher for um, 35 years, and she retired at the age of 72. And that's usually when people start gasping. They're like, <gasps> I know, right? And she was an ELL teacher, and she was one of two teachers certified Back in the day, it was called Tessel in the city of Chicago back in the, in the 70s. And I would come home. I was first living with my mom when I first became a teacher. And I'd come home, you know, frustrated. Because, you know, when you're like 22, 23, it's like, I will change the world. <laughs> and so I come home and I'm like, meh, 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 meh. and all I'm doing is complaining about, you know, stupid stuff that's going on in, in, in a district, you know, that's very large and complex and can, you know, be quite bureaucratic. And so my mom says to me, she says, Katie, just remember that what we do as teachers is always about love and social justice. That's what matters. And you need to focus on that. So my mom passed like eight years ago. And even when I go into you know, some, some, some really tough situations and I'm getting a lot of you know, um, pushback, I, keep remind, I hear, still hear my mom whispering to me that what we do as educators is about love and social justice. If you didn't believe that, you wouldn't be here at 9 a.m. And um, But I really do believe that to my core. So I want to thank you, not just on Teacher Appreciation Day or Educator Appreciation Day. Um, as a colleague, I really embrace and, and appreciate your commitment to our profession because we change lives. We change kids. We grow kids. And that's what it's always about. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. Don't do we? Yeah, we've got about five minutes for three minutes. Okay, my, my handler here says we got about three minutes. So if you've got any questions or such, and if we run out of time, come visit me over at the, the book signing table. You don't have to ha buy a book to talk to me either. Just come hang out with me because I'll probably be lonely. Yeah, do so you have a, a question over here? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, 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 it's all about you, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I didn't have on there, I just showed you the four foundational center, is, is that I like to have an audio center. And so the audio center is where you can expose kids to higher level text because they're listening and then they have that fluent adult reader. Um, and then the other thing too is that it's choice. So choice always wins. And, and I get frustrated with some programs, I won't mention where they, what they are because I've gotten in trouble in the past, is that um, some programs will, will say, oh, you have to read within this Lexile level, and, and that's really stupid. 
<laughs> because um, uh, motivation is huge as far as reading and 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 moving up those levels, especially with the kids who have cracked the code. So as far as exposing kids to higher level text, you always have that variety. And you'll always be amazed because you'll have a kid maybe at a 400 Lexile who will pick something at a 600 Lexile. I will tell you this, this is why we can't just depend on Lexile. Lexile really just gets at the decoding of text, okay? Um, 50 Shades of Grey, Charlotte's Web, same Lexile. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would say Charlotte's Web has a better literary value, but um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so, so just because a second grader, a third grader can decode it doesn't mean they should be reading it. And we get into that problem a lot with gifted kids where everybody wants to give a fifth grader Hamlet and, and, and the complexity comes in what they do with the text, not just reading it, okay? What other questions do you guys have or comments? Yep. Yeah, so here's the cool thing about it is that, um, and I, I didn't go more in depth because I do like two-day workshops just on getting this model off the ground. And um, it depends on the grade level. So remember, attention span is finite. So if I have 10-year-olds, I'm going to make them about 10 minutes. If I have 15-year-olds, I'm going to make them about 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so if you have a 90-minute block, you can probably do mini-lesson guided practice and your centers in one block. If you don't, if it's like a 45, 50-minute period, instead of like, you know, again, this is like how I ch have to change my, my thinking, is that, you know, we were all taught you have your open bell ringer, do now, whatever the heck you want to call it, then you go into your instruction, and then you have a wrap-up. And that doesn't work with this model. So if I have like a 45, 50-minute block, on day one, I might do mini-lesson, guided practice one center and then the next day we pick up with centers and you know those kids who are absent who ask if you did anything which you never did when they're absent right guess who's coming to the teacher led center first it's like you're mine baby come here and and then I take my absentees and and I get them on track so that's a way to deal with truancy because I bet none of you have truancy issues either right yeah everybody comes to school every day and prepared and yeah, okay. Anyway, a uh, question over here. Yeah, I saw things. Um, what would you recommend um, instead of practicing, like, for my art collection right now, practicing? Have them come to you. Have them come to you. Um, okay, the first thing is to admit, and then you change, okay? So, so um, when you have that teacher-led center, bring your puppies to you there. And if you're checking for fluency, things like that, you can check for fluency. What grade are we talking? It's only, oh, it's an intervention. Um, I, again, I would have that teacher-led, have them do audio assist, have them read together in small groups. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and do it, yeah, yeah. And how many kids do you have in a group? Yeah, see, because what's happening, especially with intervention, is this, they just keep practicing and you keep giving them models for disfluent reading rather than fluent reading. Yeah, so you want to pump them up with fluent reading. But then if you're checking for fluency, you want them in the teacher-led center, and that's an assessment, right? And you're checking for fluency there. But if they're practicing, have them listen. Um, audio assist. This is where audio is good. I know in some, some places, um, uh, if they do audio, people go nuts and like, no, if you're doing it in centers and doing it for additional practice, this is good. Um, that eight track is good. Um, and, then, uh, and then having them read together. So reading together in a small group is different than, than round robin reading. Because the other thing too is they don't pay attention. So if I say you read the first paragraph, second, third, fourth, what are you thinking about? Yeah, the one I'm reading, I could care less what anybody else is doing, you know. Yeah, um, in the balcony, yeah, there was a question in the balcony? No? Okay, yeah, this side of the balcony. Yeah. Yeah, it, well, it, it, it it's what varies so widely, right? Um, a lot of the schools that I use, you know, do NWEA or they have some other kind of assessment system, so that's what we use. You know, so for instance, in East St. Louis, we were using NWEA, whereas in Farmington, they had benchmarks, benchmark assessments that were established by the district. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah.
Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, they're extensive. Are you in a striving reader estate too? A yeah, striving reader grant? Okay, so because um, anybody anybody do striving readers in their state right now? Yeah, okay. So there's like even more on that too as far as evaluation. We usually customize it based on what the assessment system already is in place in the district, and then we harvest the data from there to make the argument. And, and that's what we generally do rather than having to do something additionally. I still don't know if I've answered your question. So let's talk afterwards so I can um, better understand contextually what it is. But that's what we usually do because I try very much to not add more assessment, right, um, and, and actually limit it uh, um, because some of the assessment um, – products that are out there, it's like, when do you teach, you know? So one school that I was working in, we figured it out, and they had 70 days of assessments going on in the building because they were a watch school. I'm like, this is stupid. Sometimes you just got to say something stupid. That's stupid. That's just dumb. Yeah, I sound like a seventh grader. That's just dumb. Yeah, Ken Robinson pointed out that um, we spend over a billion dollars a year, one billion dollars a year in K on K-12 assessment. That's stupid. Yeah, imagine all the materials I could have. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. Shelly's like, pull the plug on Katie. Come see me over in the... In the